Welcome to NEB TV. Today we are talking about advances in methylome analysis. In our Science in 60, we will discuss the different types of DNA methylation that exist. And then we will speak with two of our research and development scientists. And they will talk about the limitations that exist with the current methods available for studying DNA methylation. And then we will introduce a novel solution that addresses some of the challenges associated with bisulfite sequencing, and we will review the workflow associated with this product. Let's get started. The methylome describes the genome-wide modification of DNA nucleotides by the addition of a methyl group. These modifications occur in a wide range of organisms from bacteria to higher eukaryotes. Adenines and cytosines can be methylated. Adenine methylation is not well characterized, but has been observed in bacteria, plants, and mammalian DNA. The most common methylation modification is found on cytosines, where DNA methyltransferase adds a methyl group to the fifth carbon to make a 5-methylcytosine, or 5-MC. 5-MC is often considered to be the fifth base of DNA. In humans, methylated cytosines are frequently found next to guanines, and these are known as CPGs. There are 28 million CPGs in the human genome, and approximately 70% of these are methylated. CPG methylation is often associated with regulating gene expression during embryonic development and in processes such as genomic imprinting, transposon silencing, and X chromosome inactivation. Changes in methylation are also associated with diseases such as cancer. Other cytosine modifications can occur within DNA. These can be formed by the oxidation of 5-MC by the enzyme 1011 translocation proteins, or the TET proteins. 5-MC is converted into 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, then 5-formylcytosine, and finally 5-carboxycytosine. The roles of these modifications are less well established, but again are thought to be involved in gene regulation. So I'm here today with two of our application and development scientists, Chaitan Yaponalori and Louise Williams. Hey guys. Hi. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having us. And we're here today to talk about methylome analysis. So the first question that I have for you, Louise, is what is the current gold standard for methylome analysis? So the current gold standard is bisulfite sequencing, and that's been around for next generation sequencing for about the past 10 years. So what are the challenges associated with bisulfite sequencing? So bisulfite sequencing basically involves the use of chemicals. So it's harsh pH and high temperatures, which lead to damage to the DNA. Mm -hmm. So when there's damage to the DNA, it is non-random and you have biases that are introduced because of that. So you get to see high AT, low GC coverage. Mm -hmm. Also, because of this, you don't see even distribution of the coverage in the genome. So you're losing out information, which is essential. Are there any other techniques available aside from bisulfite sequencing? Yes, currently there are multiple methods that are available combining both an enzymatic step and a chemical conversion step. Mm -hmm. It could be either a bisulfite conversion or another chemical which modifies cytosines. Mm -hmm. Uh, examples could be oxidative bisulfate sequencing, also NOx-PS, or TAPC, which is tet assisted bisulfate sequencing. So these are the two that have been available for a while. And we also have something that came out recently, which is called ASIC, which involves use of apoback enzyme, which is currently not commercially available, but it only looks at uh, HMC detection rather than both 5-HMC, 5 hydroxy 5 methyl I see. Okay. So the first techniques that couple enzymatic conversion with bisulfite sequencing would face the same challenges that bisulfite sequencing Absolutely. Face. Yeah, because right. the, the DNA is still experiencing the same harsh conditions. Right. And then the enzymatic method, the ASIC, mm -hmm. um, that enzyme is not currently commercially available, correct? No, mm -hmm. it is not available. So it's a home uh, enzyme that people have used for publishing the work. But I think that introduces variability between batches of enzymes and things like that. Right, right. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the enzymatic method that was developed here at NEB? Yeah, sure. So the method that we've developed here at NEB essentially has two steps to it. Um, I'll talk about the second step first because it makes more sense that way. Um, so the second step involves the conversion of cytosines into uracils, and this uses the apobec enzyme. 
but unfortunately it also will convert five methylcytosines and five hydroxymethylcytosines as well. And if that was the case, then we wouldn't be able to differentiate between cytosines and the modified forms. So in order to protect those from downstream conversion, we first do an enzymatic conversion and oxidation using the TET enzyme. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it converts 5-methyl-C and 5-hydroxymethyl-C into 5-carboxy-C. And 5-carboxy-C is not a substrate for apobec. And so in that way, we can keep the integrity of the sequence and the methylation within the genomic DNA. I see. And this method allows you to recognize all the different types of cytosine modifications. Yes, well, we'll, we'll recognize 5-methyl-Cs and 5-hydroxymethyl-Cs. Right. So NEV just released a new product, the NEV Next Enzymatic methyl -C Kit. Can you tell us a little bit about that product? Sure. It combines the enzymatic conversion with an upstream library construction. And to do that, we use the NEB Next Ultra 2 library construction. Once we've made the library, it then undergoes um, enzymatic conversion. Mm -hmm. And then it is amplified, the library would be amplified using a new enzyme from NEB, mm -hmm. which is a polymerase called Q5U. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of using that is that it will actually amplify through your cells. So you've covered a little bit of the workflow for that product, but can you tell me a little bit about some of the advantages of using it? So as Louise was mentioning, the workflow is fairly straightforward. You make a library, you do the conversion, you amplify. So you can do this by starting at as low as 10 nanograms and you can go up to 200 nanograms. We also have a workflow which is for 500 nanograms input as well. And uh, that's a big bonus because with bisulfide sequencing, uh, people tend not to go lower than 100 or 50 nanogram input. So having something which works efficiently at 10 nanograms and also at 200 nanograms is a big plus. And the whole workflow typically takes, uh, you start off with your genomic DNA and you end up with your uh, library ready for sequencing on the Illumina platform and you have this within a day and a half. So we start first thing in the morning, you have the library ready for sequencing next day. Nice. So how is this product going to help researchers? So the whole thing about this product is that at the end of the day, our DNA isn't fragmented, and because it's not fragmented, and it also accurately represents the 5-methyl Cs and 5-hydroxymethyl Cs, it means that researchers have more options. They have options to look at um, longer pieces of DNA if they choose to, just for, for sequencing, being able to do a, a, a 2 by 150 instead of a 2 by 76 sequencing run mm -hmm. is huge in terms of being able to cover um, more, more DNA, being able to get more information in a faster amount of time, um, the ability to do other, uh, other experiments such as target enrichment or um, other things such as long-range PCRs, all of these things combined will open up the methylome for, for, for so many other people to look at other, other research areas. And if you're able to get more reads with fewer sequencing runs, ultimately you're, you're, it's a cost savings, right? You yeah, absolutely. Do, you need to do less yeah. runs, which is also a nice yeah. feature. So you actually get more coverage of the genome with mm -hmm. less reads as well. Okay. That's something we haven't mentioned before, but being, be, being able to get more for less is a, is a huge advantage for EMC. Right, right. And then, you know, now that these technologies are available, where do you see methylome analysis heading in the next few years? I mean, there is a lot of uh, buzz around using methylation information as a biomarker in cancer detection or early detection in different disease states like Alzheimer's or neurological disorders or diabetes and things like that. So it's useful to have information which is credible and accurate. So uh, cell-free DNA is another aspect where people are really interested in using this technology. Uh, FFPE, which is also highly damaged DNA, but it's very well used in the pathology sec, uh, field where there are a lot of sections already available so it's useful that you have technology that applies to material that is historically present so you can go back and uh, do longitudinal studies based on samples that are there uh, you can also uh, look at developmental biology where people are studying in biology at different stages during the development of a fetus and then want to look at methylation patterns because there's a huge swing of methylation that happens early stages of uh, 
fertilization and then followed by uh, changes afterwards. So it's going to open up a lot of uh, avenues for uh, methylation research. It is so interesting. I love the work you're doing. Thank you so much for joining me today and I'm excited to see what you're coming up with next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The EMSeq workflow is a new enzyme-based method for detection of 5-methylcytosine and 5-hydroxymethylcytosine at the single base level within DNA. This method minimizes damage to DNA and provides superior performance compared to bisulfite sequencing, including more sensitive detection of 5-MC and 5-HMC, uniform GC coverage, greater mapping efficiency, and detection of more CPGs with fewer sequence reads. The workflow begins with DNA that has been mechanically sheared. This DNA is end-repaired, DA-tailed, and ligated to the EMSeq adapter using NEBnext Ultra 2 reagents. The DNA is now ready to move into the EMSeq conversion reactions. The EMSeq conversion reaction is a two-step process. The first enzymatic step involves the oxidation of 5-methylcytosine to 5-carboxycytosine using TET2 and the glucosylation of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine using the oxidation enhancer. These reactions protect these bases from deamination in the next step. Before the second enzymatic step, the DNA is made single-stranded using either formamide or sodium hydroxide. Apobec then deaminates cytosines into uracils. Because 5-methylcytosines and 5-hydroxymethylcytosines were protected in the first enzymatic step, these forms are no longer substrates for apobec and are not deaminated. The last stage of EMSeq library construction is PCR. The EMSeq libraries are amplified using NEBnext Q5U. This is a modified form of NEBnext Q5 polymerase that can amplify uracil-containing templates. And in EMSeq, the primers used for amplification contain unique dual indexes, and the amplified libraries are compatible with the Lumina sequencing. For bioinformatic analysis, pipelines used for bisulfite sequencing can be used for EMSeq.